Panda here, and I was thinking the other day about just the most disturbing lines of books that are imprinted, ingrained in my brain, that haunt my nightmares. And so I started going through my books and reading lines that I had highlighted or coming to books that I knew had lines that had disturbed me. And so I came up with this video idea. So here we are. I'm going to be giving you a few lines that are just so disturbing they've stuck with me and please before i begin leave the line that haunts your dreams the most because um i'm very curious to see the kind of different things that bother each of us let's just get started because i'm very excited for this video the first one you know what the first one let's start with invisible monster by, by chuck palahniuk i think i'm saying that wrong but um i actually just lent this book to somebody so i don't have a physical copy with me but i do have the quote because i know what it is because this line has forever been in my brain. I think I read this like fresh out of high school. That was my Chuck Palahniuk era. This line has always forever stuck with me. It says, no matter how much you think you love someone, you'll step back when the pool of their blood edges up too close. That line has always bothered me because it's so true. It's a disturbing line. It always sticks with me. By the way, I'm saving my best for last. So let's get into another one. This is The Ruined Scott Smith. A lot of this is disturbing. It's about a group of tourists who get stuck on these ruins. The indigenous people of the land won't let them leave, and then they come to find out why. So the whole time you're stuck with them, you really get to feel like their thirst, their hunger, their fear. It's written in such a way where you feel like you're there with the characters, and books like that just really impress me. So anyways, uh, I would like to read this line to you. I have read this on my channel before, but I just, I cannot get over this line. It's so good. By the way, I'm trying not to give anything away with these lines, so I'm keeping it pretty vague and I don't think I'm like ruining any huge plot points, but some things um, I have to give you a little context for. So this, just know somebody is burned, okay? Somebody got burned. But it says, <laughs> Eric could hear the flesh burning, a spitting, snapping sound. He could smell it too, and was appalled to feel his stomach stirring in response. Not in nausea either, but shockingly, in hunger. Oh, it's such a gross line. And I think about this all the time. This book gets to me. The next one let's talk about is this guy. So this is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. And honestly, if you want something dark, pick up anything Sylvia Plath has wrote. It's always very deep and emotional and, oh man, the internal struggles of the characters, it's just wild. But that's not even what we're getting into. We're not even getting into like the dark topics, the mental health issues or any of that. We're honestly just gonna read the first paragraph from the first to the second page. So I believe in the book she's dating someone who's pre-med. I think that would will make sense to this. It says, it was like the first time I saw a cadaver. For weeks afterwards, the cadaver's head, or what was left of it, floated up behind my eggs and bacon at breakfast. And then I'm gonna skip a little line. And pretty soon I felt as though I were carrying the cadaver's head around me on a string like some black noseless balloon stinking of vinegar. Holy shit, I love that line so much. I think it's such a good representation of the things that haunt us, how they're always like appearing in our subconscious, in our dreams, in our thoughts. And they do, they, they just haunt us, they're always there. I think that's such a wonderful line of disturbing things that we've witnessed in life that always come creeping back up. Next up, we're going The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. You guys know I love this. So if you guys have seen Hellraiser, you can imagine that where it derived from can, is probably pretty dark and you are not wrong. There are a few quotes that I wanna to read to you in here. And first I wanna read a description of the lead Cenobite. It's clothes, some of which were sewn to and through its skin. And then I'm gonna skip a little part. When it spoke, the hooks that transfixed the flaps of its eyes and were wed by an intricate system of chains passed through flesh and bone alike to similar hooks through the lower lips were teased by the motion, exposing the glistening meat beneath. And then here we have one about a body that's on the floor. It says, it was being drained of every nutritionist element, the body convulsing as its innards were sucked out, gases moaning in its bowels and throat, the skin desiccating in front of her startled eyes. So good. I mean, one other line is like, no tears please, it's a waste of good suffering. Although that line isn't necessarily bloody, I think it's dark to think of someone saying that to you, like you're visibly upset, you're crying, and somebody says, no tears please, it's a waste of good suffering. If some demon said that to me, yikes. And then just this last one here, it says, then he came unsewn, his limbs separated from his torso and his head from his shoulders in a welter of bone shards and heat. 
Clive Barker, you guys know, is one of my favorite authors ever, and there is an example of why I absolutely love this book. Next, we're going George Orwell, 1984. So this is disturbing on a few levels. This first quote, again, isn't creepy in the traditional sense, but it says, nothing was your own except a few cubic centimeters inside your skull. So if, if you guys have never read this book, it's about like a dystopian of... Uh, uh, what do you call that? Big Brother Society. I'm sure most of you guys have seen, have read this or heard of it. But this next quote is a man talking to Winston about why he likes watching these public executions. And he says, I think it spoils it when they tie their feet. I like to see them kicking and above all, at the end, the tongue sticking right out and blue, a quite bright blue. That's the detail that appeals to me. Just disturbing to think about somebody talking so loosely about death. And then this last line really gets me. This is when Winston witnesses somebody being taken into room 101. And the man says, I've got a wife and three children, the biggest of them six years old, you can take the whole lot of them and cut their throats in front of my eyes. And I'll stand by and watch but not room 101. I mean, I think that quote speaks for itself. Next up, we're going another Sylvia Plath. This is Ariel. This is just a book of poetry. But again, I mean, Sylvia Plath's work is pretty dark. Her work is very heavy. And so anyways, this is from Lady Lazarus. I think this is my favorite Sylvia Plath poem. But then this quote has just stuck with me, just ingrained in my brain since the day that I read it. And it says, um, so if Lady Lazarus, so it's about coming back from the dead a few times. And she says, and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Dying is an art like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. So that um, worms off me like sticky pearls, that quote just blew me away. This poem blows me away, honestly. And so in college, we had to take something that we liked and change it into something that we did. So if we wrote short stories, we would have to take a poem and transfer it into short stories and then vice versa. I ended up taking this poem and turning it into a short story. And it is actually one of the stories that's linked down below and it's called Maggots Like Pearls. If you can't tell, this line is where I got the inspiration for the title and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Oh man, Sylvia, you do something to me. Next up, we're going Dante's Inferno. I talk about this book a lot. It's about Dante venturing into the rings of hell and he stops along the way and talks to different people about why they're there. And so um, there are lots of lines like this one, for example, where it says, I saw it, I'm sure, and I seem to see it still. A body with no head that moved along, moving no differently from all the rest. He held its severed head up by its hair. So there are tons of quotes like that. I mean, look, imagine walking through hell. There's disturbing, dark, messed up stuff happening everywhere. But this particular one, it really gets to me. So he's talking to this man who's bent over and the man is explaining how he ended up in hell. So he's talking about when he was alive and held captive. Uh, brace yourself for this one. He says, I bit my hands in anguish and my children who thought that hunger made me bite my hands were quick to draw up close to me saying, oh father, you would make us suffer less if you would feed on us. You were the one that gave us the sad flesh. You take it from us. I'm going to skip down. He says, by then gone blind, groped over their dead bodies. Though they were dead two days, I called their names. Then hunger proved more powerful than grief. Now it's back to Dante. He spoke these words then, glaring down in rage, attacked again the wretched skull with his teeth. He ate his kids. He ate his fucking kids. Tell me that will not haunt your dreams. I mean, that is so dark. I just can't. I just can't. I can't. Those are a few quotes. They keep me up at night. I think about them all the time. These quotes are always just in the back of my head. So let me know what type of quotes bother you from books or if there are any that like stand out in your head and are prominent. It's interesting because some of the most disturbing quotes don't even have to be bloody or gross. Like that 1984 quote, for example, it's just a line about how you're not free un unless you're, you know, thinking in your mind. Even that quote is as equally disturbing as some of the more bloody ones. But that's it for this video. Thank you again. And I will see you next time with another horror video. Bye guys.